Hi, guys. How are you? <laughs> Lena Hall, or as I like to call you, Lena Rocker Hall. Yeah, that's just my, that's a handle. So that happened accidentally. I was like looking for handles on Twitter. And um, I was looking like Lena Hall, Lena Hall 201, Lena, whatever, I don't know. And I was like, well, what about Rocker? And so <laughs> that wasn't taken. So I was like, great, Lena Rocker Hall. And people actually think it's my middle name. <laughs> Oh, man, when I have a kid, I want to name it Rocker, like make that the movie. Yeah, Lena Rocker Hall. Like, like that, but it, it's good because people people think it's cool. But I'm it just cool. like, oh, it's it really was cool. just a Twitter handle. <laughs> um, so speaking of rocking, you have this show coming up at the Cafe Carlisle. Yeah. Which is known for being this kind of fancy cabaret space. And then you come in and you just edge it up like in such an awesome rock and roll way. Yeah, well, um, yeah, the Cafe Carlisle, they, they usually do like uh, standards or all show tunes or something like that. And when they asked me to perform uh, the first time at, at, their, at their venue, I was like, you know how I sing, is that okay? And they're like, yes, we want you to do what you do. Uh, we want to bring a bit of a different crowd in. We want, we want to edge it up a little bit and um, we want a little bit of some kind of new energy. And so I went in and I did um, Sin and Salvation, which was what you guys were listening to, and, um, uh, and, uh, and they loved it. And so uh, after I did that, I did, um, they asked me to do like a last minute show and they were like, can you do a last minute show one night only for us? And I was like, yeah, absolutely. And they're like, can you ask one of your famous friends? <laughs> And so the first thing that came to mind was Michael C. Hall, because I love him and I, I love performing with him. And um, I know that he's a huge fan of Radiohead, so I needed to like get him hooked into wanting to do the show. And so I was like, hey, will you just do the show with me? You can do like three songs and it'll be all Radiohead night, whatever, is that okay? And he was like, yeah, totally. And then by the end, <laughs> by the end of rehearsals, I had like, I had slyly convinced him to do seven songs. Awesome. <laughs> like, I was, he would, like, every time a song would come up, he'd be like, you're doing fake plastic trees? And I was like, yeah, yeah, I'm doing fake plastic trees. He's like, I love that song. I was like, do you want to try singing it? And he was like, uh, uh, okay. I was like, yeah, okay. And then he'd sing it, and I'd be like, that was beautiful. You should do it in the <laughs> show. <laughs> I love it when people are like, Dexter can sing? Yeah, oh, Dexter sings amazingly yeah, beautifully. He yeah, he sounds kind of like Bowie, which uh, I had mentioned in, a, in an article um, in an interview when he was coming into Hedwig, they asked me what he was like, and I was like, well, he sounds like David Bowie. It's really cool. And uh, anyway, so that show was a success, and then they asked me to come back to do two-week residency again, kind of like Sin and Salvation. But this time around, um, I'm, I'm telling a story uh, about, a very personal story about my, um, uh, my relationships or, uh, or the disasters that were <laughs> my relationships. <laughs> Is that the name of the show? The disasters, the disasters that, that were. were? It should be. <laughs> it's called Oh You Pretty Things, which we all know is a David Bowie song. It's not actually in the show. I'm not going to tell you what music's in the show because I like to be a surprise um, uh, for the Can audience. You say, is it all covers? It is all, well, no, actually. There are two original songs in there um, that uh, represent a relationship that I had with someone. So uh, so there are two original songs in there um, that no one's really heard. They're, they're on the internet, but you know, no one would ever stop and listen to them on the internet. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so yeah, so it's basically about my relationships. And, and um, I did a show at 54 Below that was about my childhood, and basically it was these songs that spark these certain memories of my childhood. And I, and I love the idea of how music can spark such strong memories. Um, it's a sense memory that happens. Uh, and, and a lot of times, I don't know about you guys, but certainly for me, um, I will hear a song and I will have a, such an aversion to that specific song because it will remind me of someone or it will remind me of like something they did or, or just, you know, like it, it will remind me of a specific memory of that person that I dated. So I'm like, ew, oh God, don't play that song. I hate that song. And people are like, why do you hate that song? It's like, uh, well. So <laughs> essentially that's like the show is about these songs that bring back these sense memories of these people um, that I was with. Don't worry, I won't name names. Like oh, I I'm wish gonna you keep would. it under the under the you know under the DL and uh, go out of order. But um, but uh, 
again, it's like we date people and they bring their tastes into our life. So their musical tastes come into our life and we listen to things that maybe we wouldn't have listened to before. And they open our eyes to a whole new genre of music. And a lot of, I mean, in most cases, it's, it's a very positive thing because they're actually teaching you something new. And, uh, and uh, in some cases, if there's some terrible things that happen, then you end up hating that, <laughs> that, that composer. So, so that's what it's about. It's playing with sense memory. It's playing with music. And, it, and it's kind of uh, telling you about where my, my musical taste came from. I want to just go back to the 54 Below show you mentioned. I heard a rumor that that might be an album that's coming out. Yes, that is an album that's going to come out. So uh, we've been mixing it, and it's in its final mix stages. So now I just have to pick a date to do a release. Um, we didn't actually do a live recording in-house during a show because I told too many stories that linked into the music too much. So I would have had to just release the entire show. And no one wants to hear that. So <laughs> no one wants to hear me rambling. But um, <laughs> I beg to differ. <laughs> Especially rambling over a song. Like, it's like, OK, no. But, um, but what we did was we went into a studio. We went into a great studio. And uh, we live recorded it in a studio. So we live recorded the music. So it is a live album. Um, cause I'm, I'm, I'm into that. I'm not into a lot of like production, uh, on my albums. I like for you to hear the real, the real deal, what, what, what's really going on. I feel like sometimes, uh, vocalists are overproduced, um, uh, meaning they're edited too much in one, in one performance and, uh, and you don't get the real emotional value and the real emotional quality of their performance. And so I love to do one take and have that be the take that we use because then you get the full emotional performance of that song in, in an album. And so while it doesn't sound like a typical pop album because a pop album is very produced, um, it has its own flavor to it. It has its own rawness to it. And, and, I'm, and I'm a huge proponent of, of that. I wish, you know, I wish more artists would, would, would do kind of a live, like a real live album where we could hear and, and experience their performance more, um, more realistically, more true. Because I, I think people are obsessed with um, perfection and, and it becomes too perfect to where it loses its soul. And, uh, and what makes certain artists so cool is that there are mistakes in there, but the mistakes are what make it so interesting. You know, if it was perfect, it wouldn't be as interesting. So, like David Bowie, for example, like he was like, if you listen to his recordings, there are there are mistakes everywhere. His voice cracks, his you know, but there's a vulnerability about it, and and you're drawn into that artist. So I'm very interested in that. Like that's something that I love. Like I'll sing. A, sometimes there'll be a time while while I'll belt a high note. And I'll crack in the middle of the high note, but I'll just keep fighting for it. Like, and I'll just fight my way through that high note, you know, and it makes it more exciting. The audience is like, oh my God, is she gonna like fail? <laughs> and then they're excited and they're on my side, and you know, and it's like we, we fight through it together, and it, it's something that everybody gets to experience. Well, risk taking is one of my favorite things about you as an artist. And um, I wanna veer into talking about the other huge news, which is that you are going to be performing in Hedwig and the Angry Inch again. Yes. And not just in your Tony winning role as Yitzhak, but you're actually gonna be playing Hedwig. Yes, yeah. For a few select performances in California in October and November. Yeah, yeah, that. So Okay, yeah, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I was going to say, I want to go, <laughs> before we talk about the upcoming performances, yeah. I want to go back and, first of all, congratulate you on the Tony Award for Best Featured Actress in a Musical 2014. Thank yeah, thank you. Um, you won this award for a role that is like not written as like super meaty, but you somehow created an entire life for Yitzhak. And you started doing that from your very early on in the audition process. Yeah. Which was so risky. <laughs> and so, like, you just put yourself out there in a major way. And it makes me admire you so much as both a human and as an artist. Thank you. <laughs> uh, can you talk about the audition process, especially this legendary video that you created? <laughs> yeah, I know. It's like, it's like, it's like, um, it's like an urban legend. People are it like, is. where is this video? Like, where can I see it? And I've been asking if I can release the video on my YouTube page because I think everyone would like to see it. But 
so I'll have to explain. Like people are like, video? What do you mean? Uh, so, uh, so I went in initially. I really wanted this job. I, I had heard it was coming up, and I wanted to be a part of the show because it was a show that had changed my life when I saw it. It was like it had opened my eyes. I, I loved the music. I loved everything about it. And I that sobbed. Was at the Jane in the That 90s. was at the Jane, yeah. I saw, um, I did not see John Cameron Mitchell. But, uh, but I, you know, I, at the end of the show, I was like, had my arms in the air and I was, so, I was like, ugly cry. I was just so into it. I was like, God, I love this. And then the music, the music I listened to for years and years and years. And, um, and then when I heard it was coming to Broadway, I was like, I must I must do this. I must be a part of this. And so I knew the show relatively well. So when I when I went in for my initial audition, I decided to go in in full drag, like full on dude with a mustache and like and I knew he was a roadie. So uh, so I was like, OK, well, how can I do that? Um, I knew it was rock and roll and I didn't want a piano to accompany me. I wanted a guitar. And so I asked my guitarist um, to come in and uh, play electric guitar, and I brought an amplifier with me into the room, which is something that no one would dare do. <laughs> and so uh, when they called my name, I had my guitarist go in first with his guitar on, and then I came in behind him with the amplifier and like, like the a cord, roadie. like a roadie. I set the amplifier down, I plugged it in, I plugged him in, I like tuned, like tuned him up. And then I said, hi, I'm Lena Hall. I'll be singing, like, Kiss Me Deadly, <laughs> you know, which is the lead fourth song. And so I did it with a guitarist, and they were like, what? And <laughs> so they called me back. And, um, and I did all the, all the stuff from the show. And basically for my final callback, John Cameron Mitchell had me. He was like, I want you to come in, and I want you to be Yitzhak the entire time. So once you enter the room to when you leave the room, you are Yitzhak. We're going to ask you questions you have to answer in character. We want you to tell a story. You're going to do an improv scene with John. You have to do it all in character. I was like, oh, okay, okay, great. So I was like, how can I make it, like, why would Yitzhak go into an audition room to audition for these people? Like, why would he be in there? He's not auditioning for Hedwig. He can't be because that's his reality. So it wouldn't make any sense. So I was like, well, why is he in there? So what I decided to do was I wrote a two and a half minute monologue about my backstory, which uh, was that I grew up in northern Croatia and in a, in a small town that was like a boom town because it was a yak hair farm town that produced, was the sole producer of the yak hair for the Broadway musical Cats. Which I want to pause and just say, <laughs> Cats was Lena's Broadway debut. Cats was my Broadway debut. So I knew a lot about the yak hair in Cats. Does, does Cats, like did it actually use yak hair? Yes, they use yak hair in the wigs. That's amazing. That's a true. That's truth. And so I was just like, I was like, well, what do I know? And so, you know, so it was, you know, a communist town that supplied the yak hair for, for cats. And, um, and then, uh, and then like to, to celebrate, we do like a government funded production of Vladimir Lenin's cats where at the end, um, this is, you know, in my town and at the end, instead of one cat going to the heavy side lair, all the cats shed their belongings and went up together. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, anyway, so my to make a long story short, which is too late, um, my uh, my mother burned in a like burned uh, and died, and my all my belong they all it all like went up in flames in a yak hair fire, and uh, and the only thing left over was a rent cassette tape that was my that I felt was my mother's way of telling me to go to the you know United States and make your dreams come true and, and be on Broadway and be in Rent. This is all in character as yet. This is all in character as Not Yitzhak. your actual history. This is not my actual history. <laughs> <laughs> and then Yitzhak finally gets to America, and he, he goes to where Rent is supposed to be, and it's Newsies, and he's devastated because Rent is closed. <laughs> and so the whole reason why I went in for that audition in the first place was because I was starting a Kickstarter campaign to, be, to, to bring Rent back to Broadway so I could star as Angel and Rent. And so I did, after I did that two and a half minute monologue, I then opened my computer and I pressed play and there was a two minute Kickstarter campaign video that was like, had all the rent music in the background and like, it was like, I had a candlelight vigil for my family in front of the Winter Garden Theater and like, like with a yak hair um, wreath 
It just a silly thing. You have to find a way to get this video out there because the I, reason, from what I understand, the reason that you you can't show it or that it was taken down was that this wasn't just a fictional video for a fictional Kickstarter campaign. Didn't you actually create a Kickstarter? campaign? I wanted to actually create a Kickstarter campaign for Yitzhak. Like if you donated it a dollar, you would get your own candlelight vigil in front of the cats, the Winter Garden Theater, <laughs> like like things like that. Like I, I had this whole plan for Yitzhak. That may, maybe it'll happen, um, but I'd have to go through the production to see if they would be interested. Um, but they, they, they actually didn't want it up because um, the way I looked for the character was not the way I ended up looking for the production. So they didn't want people to be confused and get used to this one look for Yitzhak and then have me be a different look for, uh, for Broadway. So maybe after I'm done with my my uh, my stint in in LA and San Francisco, maybe then they'll let me like finally release it and let people see the madness. Uh, I feel like we could spend an hour and a half talking about just just like just Yitzhak. Well, I was gonna say just the, like the transformation because you mentioned you didn't look in your video. You said you had in the video you had a mustache. In the show, right. it, the to me the thing there are two things that make Yitzhak into Yitzhak as opposed to looking like you right and most pronounced is the eyebrows. the eyebrows and then the other thing is the fact that you like insisted on wearing a packer in your pants which I love yeah well you know the eyebrows they make the men and that's that was like my that was like my theme I once I got the job I I um I had I was like well mm, how can I convince the audience that I'm actually a dude and really surprise them at the end because that was my biggest goal. And, uh, and so I studied what men look like. Like I just like really was very aware. I studied how men walked. There's all different types of walks. I named the walks and then I was like, well, what kind of walk would Yitzhak have? <laughs> like, um, you know, how, how they stand, how they react, how, how um, uh, very uh, stoic they can be and, and how their emotions just kind of bubble under and they're not overly like emotional and stuff like that. So it, it, it there were many, many things that went into Yitzhak and the transformation of that. And, you know, one of the main things is that they have stuff mm -hmm. between their legs. And I was like, I need to have that because it'll help with keeping me in character. It'll help keep me, like, focused because I'll feel it, you know? And because I'm sure men do know that it's there all the time. <laughs> so it's like it was something that was important for me um, to have is very realistic uh, feeling of that. So you're going back to Yitzhak. I'm going, I'm going back to Yitzhak. I but you are it. also going to be playing Hedwig, which traditionally has been played by a male actor. Yeah. John Cameron Mitchell has actually said a quote I love, which is that Hedwig is not just male, not just female, but a gender of one. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, and gender queer is another word that comes up a lot. Um, I only know of one other cis female who has played the role, which oh. is Ali Sheedy. Ali Sheedy, yeah. Um, what <laughs> does this, what does it mean to you? How did the process come about about you playing this iconic role that has traditionally been played by male actors? Well, when, um, uh, there was a time when actually uh, Stephen Trask and I, we were trying to convince the producers to let us do like a short stint on Broadway together, him as Yitzhak and me as um, Hedwig. And, uh, and a lot of people were on board with that. And I know that Stephen Trask has always wanted me to, to play the character because he, you know, he loves the way I interpret the music. And um, I've seen you perform Origin of Love on stage <laughs> before, and it is brilliant. <laughs> Thank you. I I'm, mean, the I'm, music I'm flying to San Francisco just to see you play. Yeah, that's Hedwig. awesome. <laughs> so, um, so it kind of came about because they really wanted me to open the tour, and uh, and I I had said goodbye to Yitzhak in such a grand way. There's no bigger way you can say goodbye to anything because it was the I've never been a part of such an emotional, such a, a, a huge moment. I mean, it was, it was incredible. And I was like, I can't go back to him. I can't. Like, I said goodbye. Like, I, I just can't do it. And, um, and they said, well, what if you played Hedwig once a week? Is that interesting to you? And I was like, yeah, that's totally interesting to me because <laughs> I'm one to do things that are insane. So <laughs> there, so on top of doing all seven shows for that week, I'll be doing the eighth show and playing Hedwig. So um, basically I said, all right, well, if I'm going to do it, we have to do it under under my terms because 
you know, I don't want to feel like I need to feel like taken care of a little bit. Like you guys are totally on my side for this. And um, and since I'm like the first kind of female to do it in this production, I need to make sure that I'm doing it right and that like that they're really gung ho about hiring other women to do it, about going and hiring maybe a transgender person finally to do it, like to to really kind of open up the casting instead of just these male like these famous males, like famous men, because there's only so many guys who can actually do this role until you have to start figuring out who can who can play it really well and who may not actually be just a dude. So <laughs> so I I really hope that this opens up the floor. It's kind of like it's kind of like, you know, now we're going to you know, we have a woman um who's our nominee yeah. for, you know, our presidential nominee and that's also breaking a a big barrier that's breaking a big boundary and while mine is totally not that big it is like it is the start of maybe hoping to have other productions that will think of casting uh women in in men's roles and 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 also transgender and also like looking outside of the typical gender box and and seeing that yeah there's there's all kinds of things you can do and all kinds of fun casting you to be had is steven trask gonna come play yitzhak no, no, I don't. I, I don't even know. They haven't even discussed that with me yet. Uh, I'm gonna just start a campaign right now. <laughs> <laughs> do that once yeah. a week with you. Uh, we are actually running out of time. Of course. Yeah, I, I hate that because I could just talk to you forever. We're gonna take some questions from the audience. But okay. There are two other things I want to quickly touch on. Yeah. One, I am obsessed with the fact that you love My Little Pony, I do. and that you actually got to be the voice of a pony who sings. Yes. Uh, Countess Coloratura. She was written for me. Yes. And based on a red carpet look that you had. Based on a red carpet look. They, I, they made the pony for me. They wrote, they, were, they wrote the episode for me because I had said friendship is magic during my Tony speech. And you have a couple of songs in the episode, which I watched twice leading up to this, this interview. Now, I, you, I think you may have recruited me as a new My Little Pony super fan. Yes. Um, will you be performing any of Ra Ra's songs at the Cafe Carlisle? You know what? I won't. I won't be. But... Um, but I love the song. It doesn't mean that I don't love the songs. Cause I, those songs are epic and they, they were so well written. I was so proud of to be like I was so proud that they wrote that episode for me. Um, I I won't be performing them, but I did perform them. I did perform them at a at a at a pony con, oh. because they have they have conventions. They have brony cons and stuff like that. And uh, and you know what? It was one of the sweetest things I've ever done. Um, everyone was on my side and was like, loved hearing me sing those songs. And I just felt like it was so cool. It was so cool to be just loved so unconditionally by this by this fandom. And the other thing is that a bunch of people uh, on Twitter, when I mentioned I was talking to you, begged me to ask you about your experience on the Legally Blonde reality <laughs> show, The Search for the New Elle Woods. Yeah. So I think it's so funny. Because back then, uh, what year was that? It was 2008. And you were pre you had red hair, and you I were presented as this like kind of cute amateur musical theater aspiring actress. Rock when in and fact, roller. you had four Broadway. I had four shows. Broadway. I had more Broadway shows than our mentor, like than Haley Duff. I was like. They were like, here's your mentor. And I was like, I hope it's Patti Lapone or Bernadette Peters or like some like, you know, like fierce, like Tony Award winning, like amazing. And they're like, it's Haley Duff. And I was like, she's been on Broadway. <laughs> like, I was like, oh, OK, you know, and and uh, she was great. But like, but it wasn't what I was expecting. I was like, I was so I don't know why I thought like. Patty Lapone would want to do like an MTV reality show, but I was in the back of my mind. I was like, "Well, Jerry Mitchell's involved. Like, it's gotta be. It's gotta happen," <laughs> you know. And so, and so that was kind of funny. But uh, I was the most experienced out of all those girls, and uh, I was a totally different human being back then. I well, mean, yeah, speaking I of transformation, looked like a completely different person. You even went by a different name back then. I, yeah, I went by my real name, Selena Carvajal. Selena Cosuela Gabriela Carvajal. And for those of Dang. you who think that I am not ethnic, I actually am. I am Spanish, Filipino, Swedish, and then German and Scottish. So all the Swede and German and Scott just took over. And but then there's this like Spanish Filipino that's in there that that is totally unexpected. And for some reason my dad had to name me Selena Consuela Gabriela Carvajal. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go to the audience for a couple of questions. <laughs> Hi. Uh, in honor of your like new concert, if you had to pick a song for uh, your husband Hedwig, 
uh, what song would you dedicate to him? Like, what reminds you? What song would I dedicate to my husband? Well, you know, it would probably be that Sex Pistols song, Holiday in the Sun. I don't know if you guys know that song. If you don't, listen to it. Listen to the lyrics. It's really cool. It's about the Berlin Wall. Yeah. Anybody else? Hello. Thanks for being Hi. here. Yeah, of course. You're so talented. So I was wondering, <laughs> before you hit the stage, do you have any rituals before you... Any rituals? Yeah. Um, you know, I, uh, I get extremely nervous every time before I go and sing. I don't know why. It just never gets easier. It's always just gets, um, I, I always get nervous. And, and the more pressure I have on me, like this Hedwig thing, um, I will be, like, I get more and more nervous. Um, but my ritual is I basically sit and, and getting ready for the character or getting ready for the show. So putting makeup on, doing my hair, that's very ritualistic. In fact, you have to sit there and you have to be very calm, especially when you do your makeup. I don't really like it when other people do my makeup because I enjoy that ritual. It You have to calm yourself down in order to do eyeliner, right? So it's like you can't be like this, like <laughs> eyeliner and with like lipstick. You have to be super calm. So it's like you actually breathe deeper. You're, you're much more uh, in your zone. It's when I did Cats way back in the day, um, it would take me an hour and a half to do my makeup. But I loved doing that because there was something so methodical. There was something so ritualistic about it. It was almost like, it was almost like my, um, my religion was sitting there putting makeup on and making it absolutely beautiful and perfect. And then being able to go on stage and feeling really good with the way I looked and the way I, I you know, and then it, that helped me with my performance 100%. So I like to be very methodical with what I do before I go on stage. And there's no real weird warm up or anything like that. I mean, I do like a lip trill. I'm like one of those persons who never warms up before I go on stage. I basically, I'm just like, all right, I'm good. <laughs> You know, and uh, it's more about it's more about getting into character, doing my hair, doing my makeup, and putting the costume on, and then I'm there. I'm ready to go. Yeah. One more. Hi. Thanks for being here. What a great way to start a Friday. <laughs> <laughs> so, what first inspired you to be on Broadway? Um, I I've been on stage since I was about I don't know before I was born. Um, I was born into a uh, ballet family, and so uh, I was born into the ballet world, and my first, like, professional gig was when I was three years old. I think I was paid $5, and uh, I was a bonbon on stage dancing, and, um, and from a very, very early age, uh, I was always on stage. She sang for the Pope when she was seven. I sang for the Pope when I was seven. That was an accident, but I did it, and... <laughs> Uh, and um, so, so I was I was born into a musical family. I was born into um, a very creative family. And then my sister, my sister was the one I always wanted to be like my sister because she was older than me and she was really cool and she is still really damn cool. Um, and uh, she was in a musical theater group called the Young People's Teen Musical Theater Company in San Francisco. And I saw her in a show. I saw her in Forty Second Street, and I was like. I want to do that now. I want to do that. Like, Wasn't I don't want to be a ballerina. that a show you eventually did on Broadway? That is the show I eventually did on Broadway, true. <laughs> and so my first musical, my first uh, Broadway music, like, musical was um, West Side Story. I was 12 years old, and they needed dancers. And I, I am a natural blonde. I'm actually a natural toehead. I'm actually that color. And um, so uh, they were like, you have to wear a wig because you're going to be a shark because <laughs> they had to do more dancing. And so I was a shark and they called me Conchita. And, uh, <laughs> and that was like my first musical. And ever since, like I was hooked when I did that. I was totally hooked into it. I loved it. And, uh, and from then on, uh, it all kind of happened. So. Cool. Yeah, thank you for Well, that. I want to make sure we get all the plugs out. So if you want yes. to go information on on Hedwig in California in October and November, hedwigbroadway.com is has all of the information and links. Just know that I play Yitzhak on Hedwig. I play Hedwig on a two-show day. So if you want to see both my performances, Yitzhak and Hedwig, you can go to two both shows on a two-show day. I play Yitzhak in the day and Hedwig at night. <laughs> I'm doing it. I'm signing up right now for the double header. Um, yeah, double header. Thecafecarlisle.com is where you get tickets Happy for uh, this month's residency. This month. Yeah, find um, all about my love last life. two weeks of June. <laughs> yeah. um, 
And everything else we need to know about you, uh, Lena Rocker Hall on Twitter. On Twitter, Instagram. Um, I have a YouTube series that's going to be coming out that's, um, that's like a uh, by request series. So I'll let you guys know when you can start requesting me songs. And then I'd like to request the songs from My Little Pony. Yes. <laughs> and then I'll be releasing those. I think in a month I'm going to do about 20. So, uh, so those will come out, and then I'll see how it all goes. And if people like it, then I'll do it more often. Um, so that's going to happen, too. So just, you know, uh, follow me on all my all my uh, social. And then on my website is where you can find everything, like links to all my social and stuff like that, which is just lenahall.com. There's no rocker. Just lenahall.com. Just lenahall.com. <laughs> well, you're such an accomplished, talented, I, I would say fearless, but I kind of love that you own the fear and you do everything anyway. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm such a big fan of yours, and it's such an honor to have you here. Thank, Thank you, you, Lena. Thank you for having me. Thank you.